Greetings. The following presentation will observe the beliefs and ideas of one of philosophy's most influential and iconic philosophers, Aristotle. So let's begin. Now, it may be stated that all of philosophy, to a certain extent, of course, there's always limits, but for the most part, that it can be said that philosophy, uh, in a sense, is but a scaffolding upon the philosophies of Plato, in conjunction with Socrates, and Aristotle. Now, Plato was a systematic philosopher who certainly brought about, you know, uh, key insights into additional fields uh, um, encompassed within philosophy, you know, ideas of mathematics, you know, notions of logic, but not in the logic that that Aristotle provides. Aristotle's uh, systematic philosophy is extensive, and so it, it is through Aristotle, it can be argued, that we see some of those foundational stones uh, for several disciplines within the curriculum of modern university structures today. So when somebody attends a university and you see this, this diversity of uh, disciplines and, of course, subjects, uh, it can be argued that one of, the, uh, um, you know, one of the predecessors, one of the foundational people that, that uh, influenced that was indeed um, Aristotle. So as noted, <clears throat> Plato indeed uh, um, influenced philosophy immensely, and he, he influenced, you know, additional um, disciplines. But um, the, Aristotle indeed provided a, a first systematic analysis and exposition of a diversity of subjects, including, and the list is extensive, <laughs> including zoology, biology, chemistry, astronomy, physics, anatomy, music, theology, mathematics, sociology, history of thought, law, ethics, politics, language, rhetoric, and the arts. Um, I'm sure there's others, but um, it should also be noted that, you know, the dating thousands, you know, several thousand years ago, his writings in these areas are still, you know, to this day, some of the best introductions available. Right? And should give you a sense of the influence, the 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 incredible influence of um, of the philosophy of uh, Aristotle. Aristotle also invented formal logic. Now, it's not to say that that you know he was the the originator of logic, so to speak, but uh, the idea of formal logic, right? That is almost like this formulaic process in which we, through either deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning, we're going to reach, you know, a a, a valid argument, right, or a strong argument. Um, well, at least that's the goal, and minimum, right? So Aristotle, inventor of uh, formal logic. Um, another fascinating, I think this is a fascinating fact, is that the majority of his works are now lost. And that is saying something because, you know, I, I personally own several, two volumes of uh, um, Aristotle's writing. And those volumes are immense. I mean, I, these, it's these massive volumes. And the writing, of course, you know, it's, 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 um, the font is considerably, you know, uh, smaller than the average font, um, and and we're looking at you know, you know, close to a thousand pages per volume, um, so to speak. Uh, it is just you know his the amount of writing that he encompasses, in a diversity of subjects is indeed immense, and I just wonder you know had had his works not been lost, you know are we missing out on something, you know if the majority of his works are lost. What is it that we missed out on? I mean, in, um, maybe we can account for some of his writings that are not in existence, maybe through the writings of others. But nevertheless, you know, uh, um, as a primary source, you know, it's I only wonder what might have been. Well, this is a this is a quick snapshot onto the 
uh, influential um, um, markings of uh, uh, Aristotle. Um, so let's begin. Let's begin this lecture on, on the philosopher of Aristotle. So in the following presentation, we will observe um, the following sections. One, we will observe the life of Aristotle. We will observe his conceptions on logic, knowledge, and truth. We will observe his conceptions of physics and metaphysics, and his ideals regarding happiness, virtue, and the good. So, life of Aristotle. Aristotle was born in 384 BC uh, in the region, uh, the, ci the city of Stagira, Macedonia, northeastern Greece. Now, um, he wasn't Athenian, right? He wasn't Athenian like Plato or like Socrates. Um, but he's, he's from a region not too far away there. You can note it there on the map. And um, it's notable that he's, he's a Macedonian. It's notable because, um, you know, Athens being the epicenter of the world at the time. And as you enter Athens, uh, and you're not a citizen, right? You're not, you're not even though you're Greek, you're, you're still not noted as a, a citizen of Athens. Athens, so to speak, then you're kind of limited in kind of some of your rights, right? Um, Athenians had certain privileges that non-Athenians did not, you know, did not have. So the fact that he was a Macedonian um, must have impacted, and it did impact it eventually all the way to the end of his life, did impact uh, Aristotle. Nevertheless, Back in Macedonia, right, in Sagira, he was the son of a physician, Nicomachus, mm -hmm. who was uh, not only a, a, a physician to the king, but he was also a friend, right? He was a friend to King Amintas III. Uh, Aristotle, um, um, upon reaching uh, the age of 17 or 18, he went ahead and he left Stagira. He headed towards Athens. When he when he arrived, he entered Plato's famous academy, uh, known simply as the Academy in Athens. And fascinatingly, he remained there, uh, um, very disciplined, remained there for 20 years as a student of Plato's for 20 years. I mean, quite... It's quite an extensive, you know, a learning process of sorts. Um, one would imagine that as a former student of Plato, that Aristotle would, you know, um, kind of just fall in line with his, uh, with identical principles. But uh, not quite. There were some notable differences in their philosophies. And uh, to quote Aristotle, Aristotle simply stated, look, I cherish Plato, but I cherish the truth more, right? Uh, and so this, this is very interesting, right? It's despite 20 years, and, and that's not to say he wasn't influenced by Plato. I mean, I don't think he would have been the student had he was, had it been maybe a, a different type of teacher. They certainly kind of exchanged notable of the ideas with one another. Um, when Plato passes away in 347 BCE, um, Aristotle goes ahead and he leaves Athens for Asos on the western shores of Asia Minor. Uh, today that region is known as Turkey. And there as he leaves Athens, you know, to these, these uh, neighboring regions, he develops, you know, these new, found, these new foundational uh, um, um, content areas. One of them, you know, a lot of students are interested in this. He developed the, uh, or he initiated uh, this discipline of marine biology with really notable studies. Now, this is impressive because you, you, you have to remember um, these scholars, Plato, Aristotle, the pre-Socratics, they did not have a lot of tools, a lot of resources, a lot of technology that we have today. So it's, it's considerably impressive the way they were able to create you know, uh, um, or discover um, notable uh, uh, results in particular regions. Uh, 
Right. Um, Aristotle also went about to an, an island by the near by the name of Lesbos, and there he carried out additional biological investigations. So it's like he's traveling to these little regions and he's he's discovering, you know, okay, here's this environment, here's this environment. He's observing new biological investigations. There in Lesbos, he married a woman by the name of Pythias, who who uh, gave him a daughter, a uh, daughter's name is Pythias the Younger. Right. It's not a lot known about Pythias or his daughter. Um, you know, this is Aristotle. He's we're talking about. So he he kind of tends to shadow, you know, everyone else, so to speak. Uh, shortly after his marriage, um, he receives. An invitation by the then king of Macedonia, Philip, in 343 or 342 BCE, and he offers Aristotle a tutoring position in Pella, the capital of the Macedonian kingdom. Now, this uh, tutoring position is unique, particularly because it is a tutoring position for none other than the, uh, at the time, 13-year-old Alexander, who was later to be known as Alexander the Great, probably one of the most, if not the most, uh, um, recognized and accomplished conqueror of the world, so to speak. Right? Uh, his tutoring position probably lasted two or three years. Now, in some testimonies by Aristotle on um, Alexander, uh, it's noted that Alexander really wasn't a very good student. Um, and, you know, it might not be surprising given that um, Alexander came to be a, you know, kind of an aggressor of sorts, right? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reign over this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reign over my kingdom and, and uh, future kingdoms around the world going to fall to the Macedonian Empire. So um, um, even after the tutoring, within six or seven years after he was crowned ruler, um, he also began this, you know, this conquering of the world. As noted before, uh, Alexander the Great is recognized as one of the greatest conquerors of, of, of the world, really. And um, it should be, you know, it should be noted that Aristotle was indeed his his notable tutor. Um, after being away from Athens for approximately 12 years, <clears throat> Aristotle actually returns back to Athens in 335 BCE, and he opens up a school. Now the name of his school is called the Lyceum, and um, it's noted that uh, the title refers to uh, um the god Apollo Lysias, right? Uh, there's also this notion of walking and reflecting that goes in line with the name. But like Plato, in essence, he opens up his own school in Athens as well. And it is during this time that Aristotle goes about lecturing many of his treatises. treatises. Uh, he, he instituted many research program, and historically, establishes the first major library of antiquity. Okay. Um, during this time, too, in his return upon Athens, Pythias passes away, and Aristotle then becomes involved with another woman by the name of Herpolis. Now, she gives him a son by the name of uh, Nicomachus, just like Aristotle's father. Okay. So if things are going good for uh, um, Aristotle, of course, the passing of his wife is not good. But you know he gets remarried and he has a son. He's you know in the he's the primary lecturer at his uh, his very own university, and uh, so things are going well for Socrates, and that's until at this point Alexander the Great passes away in three twenty three B C E. Now, when he passes away, uh, remember, he's neither Aristotle nor Alexander the Great. Neither of them were Athenian. You know, they were both Macedonians. So 
when when um, Alexander the Great, you know, it's of benefit to Aristotle when Alexander the Great, um, in essence, conquers um, Athens. Um, you could argue that maybe Aristotle has a certain privilege, or at least that's the perception of the Athenian people. And the Athenian people are not happy. You know, they live with him, they tolerate it, but they're not happy with uh, Alexander the Great's um, um, conquering of Athens. So, you know, when, so when Alexander the Great indeed passes, the Macedonian people are kind of in a, in a joyful glee, and they're bitter, you know, to former Macedonians in the region, amongst them Aristotle, right? So rumor starts kind of carrying around that they're going to execute him. And uh, uh, to quote Aristotle, Aristotle says, you know, um, these Athenians are not going to sin twice against philosophy. And why does he say twice? Well, of course, he's referring to the execution of Socrates. And so he's you know, he doesn't want to give them that, you know, benefit that they're going to be able to to sin twice against philosophy. So he 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 um, um, alienates himself. You know, he leaves Athens and he goes into a town by the name of Chalcis on the Asian island of Euboea. And um, I guess that change might have impacted him because a year later at the age of 62, Aristotle passes away. All right, so this is the this is the first section, uh, the life, the life of Aristotle, and we're now going to switch over to um, his conceptions on logic, knowledge, and the truth. Okay, so here I'd like to bring back Plato. Now, if you recall, Plato. Uh, you know, Plato in response to uh, individuals like the sophists who believed knowledge to be relative. That is, uh, there's not an objective plane of, um, or an objective sense of uh, um, the possibility of knowledge. Why? Because, you know, there's either a sense of subjective relativism or of cultural relativism in which the these um, relative interactions across, the, you know, uh, um, con particular context, uh, it was hard to say that the truth exists when you have so many diverse differences, again, subjective or cultural uh, essences of uh, relativism. But nevertheless, Plato stepped forward and he says, look, I, I, that relativism stuff is nonsense. Uh, and instead, I want to go ahead and bring about the idea that knowledge is indeed possible. Right? And uh, the, the, you know, the, the truth of things, we're not going to base it on these external sensory influences. Instead, the really real is given to us by this notion of forms. So the, you know, the truth of things, it's going to be conceived of in the mind. Uh, and it, this mind is beyond notions of sense experience. So, you know, these um, sensory uh, um, uh, properties from, from Plato's perspective, they're not real indicators of reality. Um, so if you recall the example of the, you know, the color of a mountain, you, know, you drive down the freeway and you see the mountain out on the horizon, and from a distance it looks blue. So you say, oh my gosh, the, the, you know, the, the ground of the mountain is blue. But that's the, so that's the that's the um, so the faults of the senses that they they're rather deceptive, because when you approach the mountain and you're there face to face with it, you realize that that notion of blueness really does not exist. Um, so that's that's you know that, that's in the background that's Plato. Now Aristotle he's going to agree with his teacher. He's going to agree with Plato. But he's going to disagree that the truth is given to us via the forms of the mind, right? And instead, he's going to say that knowledge indeed begins with the senses. Uh, so Plato come, I mean Aristotle comes to say that our sense, it is our sense experience 
that gives us the raw materials for a reliable, a reliable source of knowledge. And, and so this is interesting. And Aristotle is going to, you know, one of the questions is, how? How is it that these sense experiences give us the raw materials for uh, a reliable sense of knowledge? This is noting that uh, the senses, remember, they have the capacity to be deceitful. So bringing back Plato to light, you know, re recall, you know, his, you know, how is it that you acquire knowledge? Well, you have to have what's called a justified true belief. You know, you must believe something. You must believe it to be true and you must be justified in believing it to be true. Right? Um, Aristotle's going to agree. He says, okay, look, I'm not disagreeing with you, Plato. But you have to understand that I can't go to the mind first. I can't go to the mind first. The, the, the mind is impacted and influenced um, by the sensory realm. Remember, the senses provide the raw materials for acquiring knowledge. And it's not just observing, right? It's not just going through the senses of the world. Um, here, you there's you know once you've once you've experienced something by means of the senses, you you are then going to acquire a sense of you're, you're then going to utilize the mind. And here, uh, you know Aristotle says you know he wants to apply a clarification, systematization on one's acquisition of knowledge. So here he applies logic. So he's going to say, look, it's not, I understand that whatever it is that I see may be deceitful, but I'm going to apply the, the use of logic to make sense, right, to create these deductions or these inductions about the world that it is that I'm experiencing. In essence, the, the, the you know, so, so he's using logic and the approach to logic uh, at the heart of his system is this structure known as a syllogism. So a syllogism is a, you know, is a three, it's a three statement argument of sorts. Um, when making these logical deductions or inductions, uh, it's key to know that, uh, you know, one of the nominalizations of, of, of this logic is the use of particular terms. For it is terms that name a class, a category, or things in a deductive argument. So to exemplify, you know, consider that each statement has both a subject and a predicate term, right? Subject term, predicate term. So let me, and this is very simplistic, but just to kind of prove the notion, um, if we say all dogs are animals, so in essence, we have the the subject, um, um, all do in this case, all dogs is the subject, right? And then what's predicated of that subject is the fact that they're animals. Okay. So let's observe a, a, a syllogism at play, so you can see how how this logical formation comes about. So if we say uh, let's say we use letters, right, to stand for particular terms. So, uh, um, premise one, all A are B, all B are C, and the conclusion, therefore, all A are C, right? Um, and, thus, and thus gives validation, indeed, to... Um, um, Aristotle. Uh, here's the example. Um, all dogs are animals. Mimi is a dog. Therefore, Mimi is an animal. So the conclusion that Mimi is an animal, it's attributed to the previous premises for in, in a deductive argument, if the premises are true, then the conclusion is going to be true. So if dogs are animals and Mimi is a dog, then guess what? Then yeah, Mimi must be an animal. So you notice there's a particular procedural process. Now, in an argument, it's, it, and it is indeed an argument's inner structure 
that determines its validity. So for example, uh, here we're going to change the, the, the symbolism of these terms. So if we say this is a modus, this is what we call a, a logical formation called modus ponens. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. So exemplify. P, a fish, Q, survives in the water. So if you're a fish, you're going to survive in the water. Dolphins survive in the water. Okay. Um, so if you're surviving in the water, and a fish survives in the water, then I can conclude, therefore, Q, that dolphins survive. I mean, so rather that dolphins are fish. Okay. So logically, the structure works, and you could also argue that the premises are true, except the conclusion in this case comes to be invalid. So let's. So this is what so this is what Aristotle means by a systematization. So let's let's go to um, let's go to a logical statement. I mean a valid statement. If P then Q, P therefore Q. Uh, fish breathe using gills. Okay, so if you're a fish, you're going to breathe using gills. Q, right? Uh, gills extract oxygen from water and enable breathing. Okay. So therefore, a fish survives in the water. Okay. Um, why is a fish able to survive in the water? Well, because of the function of the function of uh, the gills, right? The gills allow the fish to to enable breathing. So, if you recall the the, the invalid statement regarding dolphins, um, yes, they're in the water, but they don't they don't have gills. So let's look at another statement. If P then Q, P therefore Q. Dolphins use their lungs to breathe. Okay. Dolphins frequently raise to the surface to breathe. Therefore, dolphins survive in water. So if dolphins use their lungs to breathe, right? Um, so if you know if you're a dolphin, you're using your lungs to breathe. Well, guess what? Because it's the lungs that you, through which you're breathing. And it's not the gills, um, then some. How can I say this? Um, again, if the dolphins use their lungs to breathe, right, then they can't continuously be breathing underwater. The dolphins have to raise themselves due to the. Their, their status as um, you know as as a dolphin to have to rise up to the surface and it is in this manner that they're able to survive on water this of course leads to the the labeling of uh, dolphins as mammals okay so this is what he means by a systematization of everything he wants to break everything down um, so for Aristotle uh, this scientific process is known as an episteme. Scientific knowledge is an episteme. And what it is, is it's not knowing that something is true, but knowing why something is true. Right? So it's not, I just don't want just to know a statement, right? I want to get to the bottom of it, and I want to know particularly why indeed it's true. Uh, knowing the explanation for the phenomenon, so if the premises are true and the form is valid, the conclusion will state a scientific true. So there's a formula of it, of course. Um, you know, there, there can indeed be some flaws with it. Uh, but in essence, you know, um, in essence, it's a... Um, um, it's a procedural approach, right? It's a, it's it's an analytical approach. You're breaking stuff down, so to speak. Okay, so this systematization, um, this is systematization of science of all scientific knowledge, uh, can be accorded for with a with a kind of like formula of sorts. So the formula is noted there, right? There's a certain patterns that. Um, 
um, Aristotle came up with. And of those four patterns, he derived that 256 valid and invalid arguments may be created. Uh, and of those 256, only 14 can, uh, are ultimately going to come to be to be valid. Okay. Uh, now, real quick, let me mention this issue of the episteme. Remember, remember the word epistemology. How do we know what we know? Well, you know, this is kind of what Aristotle's trying to get at. He says, "Look, I'm going to give you these observations." by means of premises and conclusions that are in essence, you know, observations uh, framed from raw data that can, that, which is the way in which we can try to get to that true, right? So episteme, epistemology, how do we know what we know, right? What's, what's our, what, what are the, the premises for knowledge? So this formula, it's it's very much it's compared to like mathematics, in which, you know, in mathematics it's a proof, and the premises of you know like in math, the premises in in a mathematical theorem, um, the conclusion of course is the theorem, and and the premises of that theorem that lead to that theorem, they're known as as the axioms, so to speak. Okay, so. So that's that's in essence the the how how um, Aristotle is is leading us to say look um, this is how we can validate knowledge right so a proof is a demonstration uh, it will show what the conclusion is based on based on these proof premises. And thus, because of the truth of those premises, then the conclusion is going to follow deductively. Okay. So if you have a statement that's demonstrable, right, and it's demonstrated, it's observed, it's observed, then you have legitimate starting points. If you don't have something that's demonstrable, then you don't have legitimate starting points. It, this is a bit the, the critique for Plato, because Plato doesn't necessarily have you know, legitimate starting points. Plato kind of just says, look, my starting points are already there. I kind of just know, <laughs> right? You know, I, I already know by the form. The forms are already in my mind. I don't know. I don't need any demonstrable, you know, statements or observations, right? So, um, this is the, the this is kind of the battle between rationalism and empiricism, and and it is in Aristotle that we see how all statements in a syllogism are necessarily true. At least that's his goal to show them as as being necessarily true. So we, some of the critiques with this formula are that you know uh, uh, um, critiques possible problems with Aristotle's demonstrative statements are that. It, 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 you know, you're saying, okay, here's this premise and this premise, and they lead to this conclusion. But couldn't I question the validity of each premise? And what's that premise? What's the proof of that premise? Um, so then you, you, you know, you'd have to be, so if you say, you know, uh, um, just in the case of the, of the, um, the, the dolphin, where I say, you know, uh, all fish survive in water. Dolphins survive in water. Therefore, dolphins must be fish. You see the problem there. Well, play, Aristotle might say, well, look, yeah, if we go back and validate, we, we systematize your, your some, some premises, not all of them. When you say, you know, um, fish survive in water, well, you'd have to ask, well, you know, how do they survive in water? And there you're going to note, you know, that fish have gills. Uh, and then you can, you, now when you bring in dolphins, oh, dolphins don't have gills. So how is it then that they survive in water if they don't have gills? And you see now, now the conclusion that leads towards how dolphins survive in water becomes more, it strengthens it. But the issue is that every single premise can be can require a type of proof. So it seems like it'd be you know you're 
go on forever. Well, Aristotle's not going to go there. Aristotle's actually going to say, he says, look, not everything is demonstrative. Some premises are simply intuitive. Some premises we, we just, you know, by logical accordances, we just know that. You know, if, if I say something like, uh, in the morning, the sun comes out. You know, so if, if it's morning, then the sun is out. Uh, um, you know, um, at a particular time of the day, you know, noted that it's morning is when the, the sun is out. Do I need to? Do I need to observe it? Do I need to be out there? And do I need to? Do I need a particular proof for that statement? Well, unless you're in one of these countries where you know it's half of the year is sun, half of the year is night. You really don't, right? Some some premises are just into. There's a sense of intuitive awareness about them. Uh, so to quote Aristotle, he's going to say, "Well, look, to say that what is is not, or that what is not is, is false, and to say that what is is, or what is not is not, is true." Okay. Yeah, there's an intuition. There's some knowledge that's just intuitive, right? You don't need. It, you know, demonstra demonstra demonstrative statements of sorts. Okay, so this is his conceptions regarding logic and knowledge. Okay, uh, we're going to flip over now. We're going to go on to uh, understanding of uh, Aristotle's physics and metaphysics. So metaphysics. Now, if you recall, metaphysics addresses uh, the nature of being. So some questions regarding metaphysics, you know, would be as follows, would be, you know, what is being in the general sense, you know, what is being? It's the nature of a, of a of being something. What fundamental realities exist? What is it that is real? You know, how do we determine, how do we determine that something indeed exists? How do we determine what kind of a thing it is? What basic existing things do all other things depend on for their existence? Um, so this nature of metaphysics, you know, it's, it's a question that's going to be addressed throughout all of philosophy. And even to this day, you can argue that metaphysics is continuously, you know, issues, conversations, issues of God and, and deities and things of the sort. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to certainly come to light. But um, so Aristotle... Regarding metaphysics, he's going to begin with this notion known as substance. You know, that which makes a thing what it is, right? So to regard substance, you know, uh, um, what is that thing? What makes that thing whatever it is? So a being is what a thing is. And, and we can talk in terms of both quality and quantity, and a being can also be addressed as one of the other things that are predicated as these are, right? So again, you know, it's it's this it's this subject predicate construction. If I say, well, that um, 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 that item over there, right, or that tree. If I say the tree, that tree over there. Um, is an oak tree. You know, that tree over there has green leaves. That oak tree over there is. So you see, I'm gonna I'm gonna define what the thing is, beginning with the, beginning with the a nominalization of sorts, and then I'm gonna give it its its attributions. Uh, Aristotle states. We are stuck with reality as it is, and we want to know if it is as we think it is. You know, so whatever it is that we're, we're you know, we don't just passively want to label things by means of names. You know, it's this or it's that. You know, we don't want to do that. He wants to, he wants to systematize this notion of substance. So, you know, in a sense, substance, you know, is, is, uh, in definition, in order of knowledge, and in time, you know, in a particular context. So to continue quoting Aristotle, he states, 
Therefore, that which is primarily and is simply not is something must be substance. Substance is that which is not predicated of a subject, but of all which all else is predicated. So this is important because now he's looking at the construction of particular statements. So if you say something like, you know, uh, a tree is a particular plant. Um, you know, a tr that tree is an oak tree that grows in this particular region. <clears throat> you, you, we don't say this particular region uh, um, grows oak trees. That's not what the particular region is, right? We'd have to say, you know, something like, uh, El Paso grows oak trees. Because then we can say El Paso grows oak trees. Or El Paso uh, um, um, uh, grows cotton. Uh, Los Angeles has uh, an observatory. Los Angeles uh, is often polluted. Los Angeles has a baseball team known as the Dodgers, right? Um, so, so, you know, whatever it is, whatever the, 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 the substance is, we can, we can, um, we can define it by predicated attributions, right? Uh, now remember, we're getting, we're not just getting to descriptions of things. I'm trying to simplify the, the subject verb terminology of statements, but, Aristotle, what ultimately he's going to do, we're going to try to understand this notion of metaphysics and substance. Now, one of the critiques is that isn't just like a pincushion, like so you can take any subject and you can just apply an infinite number of attributions or pins. Well, maybe, right? Maybe in the general sense, but not in terms of subject. Uh, uh, rather, not in terms of a substance. So for a substance... Uh, to, to try to garner what a thing in essence is, Ar Aristotle is going to lead us to uh, um, an understanding of a thing's form. And now we're going to eliminate this pincushion notion. So what do we mean by form? Well, by form, and, and here you want to start thinking about how this contrast, it's really not a, a direct counter, but in, in essence, it's different, right? It's different than Plato's notion of form. So for, for Aristotle, form is this notion of, of, a, of an objective shape, uh, of a pattern, a function of material stuff, right? So, so if you have matter without form and form without matter, then there's a sense of improbability, right? Um... You know, if I just have a mass of cement on the floor, well, that the matter is, you know, what's the matter of the matter? It's what's cement. That's all there is. <laughs> That's all it is. But if 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 I make a, a, a if I make a sidewalk, well, now it has form. Now the the matter of cement, now it has a form of a sidewalk. Now it has the form of a wall. Now it has the form of a sculpture, right? So for Aristotle, Aristotle is going to conclude that the essence of a thing, you know, then we're talking about substance again, the essence, the, no, the, the notion of something uh, um, um, is its form. A thing's essence is its nature, the features without which it could not be what it is. So, so think think also like in terms of being of a human, you know, if, if I'm, my matter is skin and muscles and ligaments and tissue and whatever, and, and, and it's just there, but it has no form. It's just all these different things. But if we put it into the formation of something, they would say, oh, it's a human entity, or it's an animal, or it's an amphibian Right, depending on the form, then we can say that the matter then has is, is giving a thing its the form 
is given the matter of a thing, its essence. And, and that's precisely the formula that uh, Aristotle creates. So Aristotle is going to conclude, he's going to say, matter and form as essence is substance. Okay. Now, so this is interesting, right? So now, now the, the, um, Aristotle is validating this, this metaphysics of a thing. And it's going to get complicated when he brings about this understanding of change. How so? Well, let's observe some criticism on change. So there, here are some statements regarding change. So one is, is that change is either a transition from something to that same something because the new something is present in the original something, or two, a transition from, from nothing to something. Okay, so if it's one, then no real change takes place, and if it's two, then the something would arise out of nothing, which is absurd. So these statements, again, are statements that are attempting to invalidate that change is possible. So that, that you know, if you, if you think about Plato's forms, in which the forms are eternal, well then, then, then this eternal notion of the forms, um, um, you know, if, we, if it's uh, like let's say Plato's forms in the mind, right? And we say, you know, what am I? And 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 one conceptualizes, oh, we're a soul-like entity. Well, that soul-like entity, yeah, it's it, it, there's no sense of change. Uh, and why is there no sense of change? Well, look. If, 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 you know, if, if, uh, if I am this being, right, and um, later on I change, I change to, you know, if I change from me to me, think about, think about the notion of uh, maybe yourself at, in uh, elementary school, and now perceive yourself as yourself in college, you know, obviously there's a physical change there, but people like Parmenides and Plato, of course, would bring this about and says, well, no, look, it's really no change that took place because it's still you. So no real change really takes place. It's still you. So no change is really attributed. Um, or let's say I never existed um, and I came out of nothing but then there's a type of absurdity because something doesn't come out of nothing, right? I have to, I have to somehow, some way, have existed in some way, some form, because by logical attributions that change is not possible. So see, here's a critique on change using logic. But Aristotle, he's going to clarify this. He's going to show how indeed change is truly possible. So he's going to give an analysis of change, right? And he's going to say, okay, look, I, 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 I do agree that when a thing changes, there's always something that continues in that changing patterns. That said, there's three components to every change. One is that the subject of change, right, is there. So that which persists throughout the change. So, you know, if in the change, there's always something that persists. So there's that, whatever that subject of change, it's always there. And then there's the pre-change situation. So before the change took place, there's this context of the subject of change being a certain way. But then if change occurred, then there's the post-change situation. So let's observe the first item. Okay, so the first item, right? That which persists throughout the change consistently. So whether the change is an alteration of a thing's properties or the coming to be of a new thing, there must be something underlying the process. Okay. So he says, okay, look, even in a change, there's something that always, always um, is persistent. Okay, so to further understand this, this, you know, this, this, and this, um, 
this constantly persistent element, um, he speaks of matter and form. So, for example, you're, you're going to change, right? Say, say you're going to. There's a change. So, obviously, if there's change, then there's something new. Why? Because there wouldn't be something new if there if there is no change, right? If there's a change, then indeed there's something new. But Aristotle seems to say, look, it, it's true. Uh, um, change does not come from nothing. We don't. We, the change does not occur out of nothing. Change occurs with that persistent element present. But nevertheless, there's something new. Well, in thinking about matter of form, if you do have something new, the matter is always going to be the same. The matter is going to be present. Or at least, anyways, the observable matter is going to be present. And, and so it's the matter that's the persistent element. And, and what's different is the form. So, you know, think of yourself when you're in elementary school. It's you. You know it's you. you you've got muscles and arteries and blood vessels and your face looks a certain way. Things a certain, But then later on in college, your face looks different. Your body looks different. You're a little bit taller. You're a little bit wider. You know, you're a little bit... You've garnered some, you know, you know, some changes, so to speak. Um, your form has changed even if the matter is the same. So we're still made of flesh and bones and blood and skin and things of the sort. But certainly our form is a little bit different. Okay. When there is no, when, when, when there's no, uh, when something's different, not in terms of the form, right, but let's say you impact the matter, then there's a change in minor properties. So then the persistent element uh, um, um, would be is matter, but not the form, I mean, sorry, um, uh, the alteration in the matter, but not the form. So the, the form is the persistent element, and then the changing element is a little bit of the matter, okay? And so a a Aristotle gives us this... Uh, um, this is a description regarding these these changes. So um, so he gives that attribution of change, right? And now play, uh, Aristotle he's, he's going to give a, he's going to provide what we call a theory of what we call causal explanations. So why why is something the way it is? What's the explanation for particular things? Or a, a, a phenom's uh, characteristics. So here's his here's Aristotle's theory of causal explanation, and he calls these the four becauses, four explanatory factors. So the first, and and, and we begin with this issue of form and matter, right? Uh, the first is the material cause. You know, the, the in order to understand the, how something changes or the comp the composition of something. You have to understand a thing's material, right? The material composition. Everything that you witness, in essence, is made of a particular material. You know, um, is it is it is it wood? Is it plastic? Is it metal? Is it is it mass tissue? Is it muscles? Is it blood? I mean, what is the composition of things out and about? Now. The, the second cause is what we call a formal cause. Now, all that, all that matter that you're witnessing, it might be the case that the same matter is present in many other things, but the way we understand it by its characteristics is that these different matter compositions undertake different forms. So we think structure and properties that make it what it is. And remember... You know, the form really is the essence of something, right? The form really is the essence of a thing, so to speak. Um, um, but it's form and matter that kind of are the foundations of a thing's substance. 
Um, Aristotle then is going to provide us with an understanding of what we call the efficient cause. And when we understand the efficient cause, this is this is kind of you. Know, I want you to think about the the potential of something. So you know the main source and initiator of change. So for example, let's take a block of wood. And in in in, in its initial form, you can say, okay, look, look, this block of wood. What's the material cause? Well, it's wood. What's the form? Well, the form it's it's a rectangle, so to speak. But now here comes this carpenter, and he's going to start crafting this block of wood, and he's going to turn it into a, 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 a table surface, and he's going to you know he's going to he's going to he's going to uh, um, sand it down, he's going to trim it on the edges, you know he's going to polish it off, he's going to create this circular pattern or maybe a pentagonal pattern, whatever it is, he's going to change the form. It's through the carpenter that he's going to change the form that now is going to give that block of wood the potential to be a table or to be a chair or to be a, you know, a, a kitchen cabinet or a dresser or, you know, what have you, right? So when you think of a bean, uh, um, you want to, you, you, this takes a little bit of thought, right? And you think of, okay, we begin with an initial form of maybe placenta and then we become a small child. Anyhow, the efficient cause here would be the potential of that of that placenta child's becoming. So here we, you might begin with parenting. You know, it's through the education of parents onto their children that's going to enable and enact and, and uh, uh, manifest and establish um, the being of this uh, of this uh, of a uh, of an entity right if if if, uh, if the parents don't become as involved then the potential of that child is limited um, and then we have to go further right you know we're, we're going to go further on this efficient cause um, but to understand the, the furtherness of the sufficient cause, you know, the, the maker of something, uh, we, we have to first address the next cause, which would be the final cause. And what's a thing for? For what purpose does it exist? You know, that for the sake of which, you know, blank. So, you know, to give you an example, think of a watch. Uh, material cause of a watch could be aluminum um, and could be, you know, these brass or copper gears or, you know, uh, um, maybe even some nickel and maybe even silver if need be. Um, gold in some instances, right? Anyhow, that's the material cause. The formation, the formation shape of a watch. So, so what's who's the efficient? What's the efficient cause? The efficient cause is, is that the watchmaker gives these these byproducts a a a potential to be indeed a watch. So uh, the final cause. What's the purpose of a watch? What's the purpose? Well, it's to tell time. You know, is the potential of a watch ever to be sandpaper or ever to be a washing cloth or ever to be you know whatever? Well, the answer is, of course, no. Oh, of course not, right. Uh, um, uh, its sole uh, a final cause, its sole purpose, is to tell time. Okay. So the, the purpose, uh, um, it kind of defeats this. You know, the, if you give something a purpose... You give it this accidental or random, you know, the theory of evolution. You give it, things happen by accident. No. It, it, things are built with particular purposes in mind. So if things have a purpose, then the efficient cause of being, so to speak, you, you have to argue that there's a creator, so to speak. Think of animals. You know, animals have, animals have particular functions that are different from us. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to survive out in the wild, you know. So, a, a what's the purpose of a lion? So you can you can you, you know a lion is indeed a predator because 
He has particular features a certain way that enable it you know, to attack easily and to be able to feed itself uh, you know, a certain way. In essence, this notion of the final cause is understood as a term by the name of teleology. Teleology means that there's an existence of purpose or ends inherent, inherent in persons or things. What's the teleology of a watch to tell time? What's the teleology of a chair to you know, allow people to sit down on it? What's the teleology of a book? Well, to be read, right? The tough one, you know, you think about humans, what's our teleology? You know, what's, what's our inherent purpose? A certain way. Is our inherent purpose to fly like birds? Probably not, although we, we would, what did we do? We invented the airplane or jets, you know, or, you know we invented, you know, certain, you know, uh, um, skydiving, you know, uh, <laughs> material sort of thing. So, so it's tricky, right, understanding the teleology of humans. So, so that said, uh, when you conceive of, think about this final cause notion, and you think about the efficient cause, you have to note that final cause explanations in terms of living things, right, the final cause is always, or should be, according to uh, um, Aristotle's beliefs, that we're always aiming, our potential is that of aiming towards a particular good. And if we're not aiming towards a particular good, then we're hampering our teleological final causes. So the particular good for things in and of themselves are going to further uh, empower our sense of form. So <clears throat> here's another example. Consider the movement of a stone, right? There's a, there's a, there's a rock. There's a rock. Uh, um, and I'm actually taking this. Not, this is not my idea. This is an idea I stole from a series by uh, uh, um, uh, Hillsdale University. That one of the professors there gave this example. I thought it was a really good example. You take a stone, right? He, of course, he uses it a little bit differently. But you take a stone, and how does it, let's say, you, the stone's not going to move by itself generally. Um, so you say you take a shovel and, and then the, sh you, the shovel moves the stone. So you can argue, okay, look, the shovel's moving the stone. But then you say, well, what's moving the shovel? Well, the arm is moving the shovel. Well, what's moving the arm, right? Well, the bean, you know, whoever owns that arm is moving the arm. And who's moving, the, who, what's prompting the bean to move that arm, right? Well, the, 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 the teleology of the bean, right? The, 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 the bean is triggered to do things a certain way. But the point is, can this go on forever? Can this, can, can we, you know, in terms of understanding the final cause of, a, of an entity or of a thing, is it, is it, is it infinite, and, well, Aristotle plays with this a little bit. He says it's possible, but uh, I think there has to be a limit. There has to be a limit that we're going to get to a point where we're going to have what we call an unmoved mover. And so this is Aristotle's notion of a god, right? This is Aristotle's god. Now, his god is not maybe the way we conceive of God today, although Aristotle in the medieval era is is going to prompt Christianity to a certain extent, but Aristotle simply calls it an unmoved mover. It's the it's the one entity that that doesn't have a preceding uh, um, um, efficient cause, right? There's not something that's going to prompt this unmoved mover. There has to be a starting point for everything. This is an this is a mover that's always existed, and so it has no previous creator, um, and so no no previous mover uh, for itself. Okay, so this idea of prior prior efficient causes going back eternally, you know, Aristotle through the unmoved mover says no, there isn't. Like there's there is indeed a limit, but it does indeed go all the way back to this unmoved mover. Okay. So in terms of a final cause uh, of this unmoved uh, mover, you know, uh, again, uh, it should be emphasized that there is no efficient cause for its being, 
but instead that he's the prime mover, right? The initial mover. And he's the, he's the basis for which all other efficient causes are going to come. And it is uh, through this prime mover that uh, we are embodied with this potential to, to, to reach our, our ultimate teleology. And so, you know, there's a type of empowering of us, of our potential, by eliciting our sense of the will. Okay. Okay. We're now in our final section of the lecture, and here we are going to cover Aristotle's um, ideas regarding happiness, virtue, and the good. So this 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 addresses an ethical perspective regarding you know this, the ideals of virtue, uh, issues of morality uh, that, that in essence uh, Aristotle is is giving us. So when Aristotle addresses you know this this uh, um, final cause right our teleology, and and our ethics, uh, remember he's saying we're aiming because of, because you know if we're we want to be happy. This is the ethics of it, right? And of course, if something's making us happy, um, then 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 we have to wholly understand uh, the the um, uh, the summation of such happiness, right? So so that uh, Aristotle is going to say, well, look, you, we're we are aiming towards a particular good, right? We're not. We're not. We have to. We have to be cautious of that good in which we're aiming for. So, for example, we, we, you know, he gives us two different types of goods. One good is an instrumental good, in that which we want to acquire something for the sake of something else. So, what's probably one of the more famous instrumental goods? Well, material goods, money, right? Why do we desire to acquire material goods slash money? Because that that particular the particularity of that good, money in itself doesn't give us happiness. It's money facilitates our access to maybe other things, food, food and water, right? Shelter, right? Maybe a bit of entertainment to for the the sanity of the self, right? But money in itself is is an instrumental good. It's not it's it's not good in and of itself. Okay. And then uh, Aristotle then gives us the notion of an intrinsic good, which he regards these as the highest good. How so? Well, this is how something is good in and of itself. It's not good for the sake of something else. It's good for the sake of its own sake. So regarding an intrinsic good, here's a good question. What is the highest good for a human being? And Aristotle, to quote Aristotle, he states, The good life is one lived according to the light of reason. It is to live rationally and to do so excellently. To live this way is to possess the moral and intellectual virtues in full. Okay. So, um, you notice his metaphysics is summed up by raw materials, the senses, you know, the... the the, the, the material and form uh, aspects of a substance. But here, um, Aristotle now, when he's talking about issues of uh, the good life, he's now going to be, he, he's, he's addressing now issues of reason, right? And, and this idea of excellence. So is this regard, you know, when we're talking about virtues, does this regard a type of function? Well, yes, it does. Right, uh, and and so this is kind of like a, a statement, a formulaic statement regarding what this ultimate good is. And Aristotle states, human good turns out to be activity of soul in conformity with excellence. And and what he's getting at again, activity of soul in conformity of excellence. So when he says activity of soul. So you're actually doing something. You have a particular disposition. And this disposition is a disposition in terms of virtue. What's a virtue? 
It's a disposition to behave in line with a particular standard of excellence. So to be virtuous, you know, some notions of excellence are like honesty, compassion, loyalty, benevolence, temperance, fairness, to name a few, right? Um, so, so you know, the ultimate good is if if you're withstanding and you're 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 strengthening a particular disposition, well, that's going to garner you the the ultimate human good. So, um, uh, continue to define a virtue. These are neither pure emotions nor the product of our genes, a choice for which we can be praised or blamed. So virtues are not something that you are born with. Uh, that's what he's saying, right? And virtues are something that you have to work towards. So, you know, you know, maybe by human nature, maybe we're not naturally honest. And so maybe honesty is indeed something that we have to indeed work towards. Um, and, and also, it's not something that's just emotional, right? We have to be, you know, think about temperance. We have to mediate our senses. We have to mediate our emotions so that we we're able to enact a, a most excellent sense of being. Okay. So how do we, how do we, if, if these are not things that we're born with, right, that, that we have to, and these are indeed things that we have to work towards, how do we recognize the virtues when we see them? Uh, well, well uh, um, Aristotle's going to say that this is not an easy feat. And Aristotle's going to note that he says, okay, look, um, to understand the most excellent sense of being with a particular virtue. So he does want us to acquire all these many virtues. And he wants us to be excellent in all these many virtues. He wants us to be excellent for our own sake, right? That's what's going to give us the ultimate sense of human good. Um, he's going to say, look, to work towards getting there, you have to understand that a virtue is the midpoint, the golden mean, so to speak, between the extremes of excess and deficit, and that the extremes we can note as vices. So uh, to exemplify, for example, so here's a so here's an example uh, illustrating this this golden mean, so to speak. So consider perhaps maybe the uh, the virtue of courage. Let's say courage, and we, we acknowledge it as a virtue. And um, you know what would be the the most excellent essence of being courageous? Well, uh, let, let's let's put it in the context of maybe unfortunate the unfortunate context of warfare. And you're out, you know, you're a soldier, and you're out there on the field. And and you wanna you wanna credit yourself as being most excellently courageous. So you say, um, don't wor don't you worry. I'm gonna launch out there, and I'm gonna I'm going to through my courage, I will take care of the the opposing foe, so to speak. I mean, war is always such a terrible thing. Nobody's really a foe. Everybody's a victim to it. But for purposes of this example, you know, let's say the soldier goes out there and he goes guns a blazing, and, and you know he, he 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 doesn't regard his the the, the sanctity of his life right, um, and he just goes out there, he just goes out there, doesn't doesn't cautiously, you know, cover himself or anything. Well, you know, Aristotle says, well, that might be admirable, admirable, or most of pretty much everybody's in observation would say, that's pretty admirable, but the, we can't deny that it might also be a bit, I forgive such a, <laughs> the banal word, it's stupid, right? <laughs> There's not a lot of thought that took place in this, right? Uh, by counter, let's, you know, I... It, uh, picture the opposite of this and picture yourself the soldier now he's in the bunker but he's not you know he's he's continuously taking little peaks here and there being very cautious that you know a bullet might be flying or something of the sort it's just there in the bunker and he's you know harnessing his his rifle and um and, and he and he's uh continues to peek and 
he thinks about going up and never actually goes through with it and says, oh dear, you know, just protect protect my life, protect my life, right? So whereas one is, 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 is careless with regards to his life and one is overly careless, uh, the one who's overly careless, he's, he's in defect, right? He's, he's, he's a coward, I hate to say it. Uh, and so that's not really showing any sense of courageousness. So the golden mean would be somewhere in between, neither too much nor too little. You got to try to, that, that sense of the perfect balance uh, in between. Think about honesty. Here's another really interesting one. Let's say, um, um, I don't know, you witness one of your coworkers or one of your classmates. And let's say they may be, they're always late, right? So you go and you tell the administrator, or you go and you tell the professor, and you say, "Dear professor, dear administrator, you know so and so is was late today," and and you do this over the course of you know every day, every every moment he, the person is late, you, you or your colleagues, whoever you witness that you witness, you go out there and you you honestly report them who need be. <laughs> right? Whereas whereas uh, uh, in the other end, you don't say anything. No, it's no big deal. Well, if you're constantly always saying it, they're always late, they're always late, they're always late. Um, th well, that's going to impact your well-being, right? They're not going to like you very much. They're going to say, you know, uh, be careful with that one. And there's the snitch over there is telling me that I'm late. On the other hand, if you, if you don't say anything then that might not be good either because maybe the particular person he's not serving the interests of the students or serving the interest of you know um, or the students serving the, the interest of, of, of their own well-being right and being in class on time and so here in this sense uh, um, a golden mean for honesty might be well look I've noticed you've come in late a couple of times, you know, and I just want to say it's important to try to get here on time because the students are, are looking forward to the class, looking forward to learning, and maybe even if they're not, you're, you're a role model for them, and you've got to set the example and this and this. So you, 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 you go address it personally, I think. They might be bothered, but I think they'll like you a little bit better if you approach it from that way rather than go excessively in an honest demeanor and report that person to to a particular administrator, so to speak, right? Um, okay, so I hope that explains the sense of the of the golden mean, right, of, of what it means to be uh, most excellently virtuous, whether it be in courage or honesty or temperance or whatever it is, right? Um, so so um, this, is, this is critical, according to Aristotle, for the ultimate sense of human good. Now, in understanding the soul, um, unlike Plato, um, Aristotle doesn't quite define the soul in the same way that uh, Plato does. Remember, Plato defines the soul as the true sense of a person, that, that the, the essence of a soul is indeed some spiritual marker that's within the box of the body, uh, that knows everything and just requires maybe essences of recollection to to empower their sense of its sense of knowledge. But um, so so, but his soul is defined a little bit differently. And so he defines the soul as follows: the characteristic functions and capacities of the body. The soul is a natural object. So notice that Aristotle is defining the soul not as a spiritual essence, but rather as a physical essence, the, the, the form of a body with life. Um, so, so um, you know, regarding the soul, um, the, maybe an example would be as follows. So consider... You know, I'll use myself as an example. Um, you know, I might I might give myself the credit with a lot of critique, of course, <laughs> but I'll give myself a little credit that maybe I'm a I'm a pretty credible reader, an analyst, uh, you know, literary critic of sorts, um, fairly knowledgeable and, and thoughtful in some aspects. So let's say I have some of those talents, right? I I, I can break down a, a book 
fairly, uh, you know, with a good sense of critique, um, and I can project uh, uh, an analysis in a very thorough, technical, and diligent way. Uh, but if you put me on the basketball court and you see me play basketball, you might conclude, "Oh dear, you know, the, feel sorry for that team," <laughs> and so my, my, I'm in trouble because my my. Um, my talents as a basketball player are not very good in comparison to my talents as a scholar. And even there, I'm lacking in many, many attributes. But um, you at least are defining my sense of being by looking at my actions, the way in which my, the way in which my mannerisms, my characteristics, my way of being, the way in which my, my sense of being acts, that promotes my sense of the soul. Of what my soul is. My soul is defined by my actions. Uh, if you witness Michael Jordan on the basketball court, you, you know my, you might conclude and says, "Well, yeah, I know." We we all define Michael Jordan not as a scientist, right? Because his soul lends itself better to his attributes as this as this fantastic, you know, athlete. Not just in basketball, but he's also in baseball and things of that sort. So um, here's this great athlete, you know, an athlete in, in, in basketball, and so by his actions as 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 a fantastic basketball player, that you know who Michael Jordan is. You don't know him as a scientist. You don't know him as a, I don't know, um, neurosurgeon or anything like that, right? That's not what their soul defines them. So their maybe maybe their sense of their teleological function, right? Their 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 final essence. Um, what is it that? What's the potency within them? In, in in view of their soul. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So the soul is defined by the actions of the body. You know, so we can we can distinguish our differing souls. By the way in which we act, by our mannerisms, our characteristics, and and things uh, uh, in that sense. Okay. And uh, another detail regarding the soul is that Aristotle also distinguishes the soul uh, in different ways. Now, according to Aristotle, he says everything has a soul. So, for example, he gives he, he defines plants as having a vegetative soul. Uh, uh, with the functions of reproduction and growth. Uh, he applies a sensitive soul to animals uh, that also have a vegetative soul, but their sensitive soul allows them to have the, the um, functions of mobility and sensation, right? So they're, they're you know, they're, these are sensitive animals. And then there's us. So we have a vegetative soul. We produce and we grow. We have mobility and sensation. Uh, we have a vegetative soul, a sensitive soul, right? And we also have a rational soul, <clears throat> the capacity to have thought and reflection. So we, we are thinking beings, whereas it's noted that, according to Aristotle, animals are not thinking beings. They're, they're instinctual and they're, they're, they're emotive, right? They feel things, but they're not, ra they're not quite rational. And plants, uh, it's noted that they don't quite have a sense of sensation. They don't have a sensitive soul, according to Aristotle. They just, their, their soul is, the functions of their soul is that of reproduction and of growth. And so this is the way in which he, he distinguishes the difference between plants, animals, and, and humans, so to speak. Okay. Well, I, I hope this has summed up uh, and given you a good perspective about Aristotle's philosophy regarding his life, his conceptions on knowledge and logic, his metaphysics and sense of the being, and his sense of ethics regarding virtues and the soul. Uh, um, I tried to be as thorough as possible, but in, a, in an efficient and uh, um, concise manner. Uh, even though it's very difficult to make, you know, these these fantastic philosophers to make them concise because there's just so much to them. Nevertheless, I've given you a uh, hopefully I've given you a a reasonable synopsis regarding their philosophy. 
So I hope this has helped you, and uh, I appreciate you listening to this presentation. Again, I hope it's been of some benefit to you. Uh, and again, thank you for listening. Thank you.